recent events in, in Syria show us that large-scale popular mobilization by itself is not sufficient to overturn authoritarian regimes that are well entrenched and well established. This may seem like a very obvious statement to make, that popular movements, popular protests by themselves are not enough to overturn long-time minority authoritarian regimes. But in the heady days of February 2011, even careful commentators on Arab affairs expected that if crowds of young people gathered together and if crowds of young people mobilized one another using social media, long-time dictators could be tossed out and that it would only take large-scale popular protest in order to change regimes all across the Arab world. For longtime observers of Syria, what has taken place inside Syria since last February is particularly puzzling. We're having a hard time coming to terms with what's going on inside the country. Many students of Syrian politics have argued that the country's new president, Bashar al-Assad, basically favors fundamental reforms, that he is someone who would like to change the country. He is someone who is familiar with politics outside Syria and might be willing to change important institutions inside Syria, but that the president has been blocked from carrying out reforms and that even though the president himself might like to change things around, nevertheless, there's a cluster of hardliners, a cluster of people who want to keep the system the way it is, and this cluster of hardliners is firmly established inside the Ba'ath Party, inside the country's main political institution, and also well-established and entrenched inside the security services. And so the president has been blocked from carrying out the kinds of changes inside the country that he might otherwise carry out. No doubt the most remarkable aspect of the current situation for many of us who are longtime observers of the country is the new president's insistence that popular discontent and popular protest has been toxic to the nation. He's on a number of occasions referred to the protesters as germs, thereby reflecting his own medical training, thereby reflecting the idea that somehow there is something physiologically wrong with the country if there are large-scale large sustained protests against the regime. The president has also insisted on a number of occasions that large-scale protest is a result of interference inside Syria on the part of foreign forces. And it's not Syrians themselves who are protesting against the government, but instead it is outsiders who have come in to disrupt the orderly operation of the country. And both of these statements are deeply disappointing for people who expected more of the current president, who thought that perhaps the current president would work to push for changes in the existing structures in the countries. If we step back just a little bit from current events, we can see that there's a substantial variation across the region in the way that countries in the Arab world have experienced what Gregory Gauze calls the winter of Arab discontent. The winter of Arab discontent has affected different countries very differently. In Tunisia and in Egypt, a long-time leader, a well-established authoritarian figure, has been removed from office more or less peacefully. So at one end of the scale, one end of the spectrum, we have this generally peaceful transition away from authoritarian rule. In Yemen, as you heard a couple of weeks ago, the president has pledged to step down on a couple of occasions in the face of widespread peaceful protest, but the president of Yemen has not yet stepped down, so he remains in place. In Libya, by contrast, the country's ruler firmly rejected demands for reform and ended up being expelled by force. In Bahrain, 
the existing leadership of the country has so far managed to survive a large-scale uprising on the part of popular protesters and has so far managed to survive more or less intact. And the regime remains pretty much in Bahrain the way it had been before. And in Syria, the outcome remains very much in doubt. I actually listened with some trepidation to the radio driving across the, uh, um, uh, Bay, uh, the San Francisco Bay Bridge last night listening to reports that an Arab League proposal to end the fighting in Syria had just been announced and been agreed to by the Syrian government. And I said to myself, geez, I've never, on the way to the airport, uh, been forced to change what I had to say uh, just before I came down to give a talk. We still are not quite sure how things are going to work out in Syria. But for all of these reasons, I think it's worth reviewing developments that have taken place in Syria during the course of 2011. 2011 has been a momentous year in this particular country. It's been a little hard to figure out the patterns, a little hard to get the story straight for what's been taking place in Syria. So I'm going to venture this evening to try to tell you a coherent account of how things have been developing in Syria as I see them. And then I'm also going to try to make at least an attempt to situate the case of Syria inside a broader scholarship the broader scholarship in comparative politics on regime change and what our friends in the comparative politics field are calling civil wars. Under what circumstances civil war, large-scale internal conflict breaks out in countries. So what has been the story in Syria so far? At the end of January 2011, the Syrian military command sent troops into Kurdish districts around the northern city of Aleppo to prevent the outbreak of anti-regime demonstrations. The city of Aleppo is Syria's large second city in the northern part of the country, and the Syrian armed forces deployed into outlying neighborhoods of Aleppo to prevent the Kurdish population from joining in popular protests. And this move of Syrian troops into the area around Aleppo accompanied reports that Kurds in the city of Raqqa and in the province of Raqqa had gone into the streets to protest after a couple of members of an organization called the Organization of Western Kurdistan had been killed by Kurdish security forces. So the very first inkling that we have of popular protest comes in the north and comes from the Kurdish population of the country. There were small protests in the capital city of Damascus in early February on the part of human rights activists, liberal activists, activists who said the country had been infringing on the terms of its constitution, that the country was not allowing the free expression of opinion and not allowing free popular assembly. So these rights activists carried out scattered demonstrations in early February. On the 1st of March, an individual named Hossam ad-Din Mansour took up a position in the middle of one of the main squares of Damascus and raised a banner that carried the slogan, quote, we have had enough. Bashar, save us from the gang. A quite remarkable event, a, a clearly political act in a country where some of these public political acts are rare. And notice what the, our, notice what the demand was. The demand was for the president to step in and protect the country, protect the population from the gang of people around the president who were blocking reform or the gang of people around the president who were corrupt and taking advantage of the country's economy. In mid-March, two dozen women gathered in front of the interior ministry in central Damascus. And these two dozen women that gathered outside the front door of the interior ministry demanded that family members who had been imprisoned by the government and who had not been subjected to fair trials should be released immediately. And they brought petitions 
to the Ministry of the Interior to release their family members from custody. When these two dozen women carried out this small, peaceful protest in front of the Interior Ministry, this action sparked a much larger protest in the area of central Damascus called Martyrs Square. And a much larger set of popular disorders erupted around the fringes of these women. More people took to the streets. More people started clashing with the security services. And a kind of small riot erupts in the center of Damascus in the, in the mid, middle weeks of March. After this, after this incident, security forces come out to the streets of Damascus in force. And the security services make sure that nothing like this happens again in Martyr Square. Nothing like this escalates out of control in the center of the capital. Notice in this very first, the very initial part of protests in Syria, we see a kind of pattern where the regime responds to popular protest with a mixture of sticks and of carrots. On the one hand, it's clear that the security services and the military commanders, especially in the capital, respond to any protests by breaking up the demonstrations by force. And the regime does use coercion to break up some of these early protests. But the government in early March also responds to the popular protests with some concessions with some carrots as well. On the 7th of March, government officials announced that they were going to provide jobs for 10,000 university graduates in Syria by giving support to private sector companies. Under the bath during the socialist years in Syria, all university graduates were guaranteed a job quite different from the United States of America. But over the last few years, the Syrian government has been unable to carry out that promise. But now the Syrian authorities promised that funds would be made available and loans would be given to small private sector companies to allow 10,000 university graduates every year to find some kind of employment. On the 11th of March, even more remarkably, suddenly Facebook became available inside Syria. Facebook had been censored. Facebook had been blocked. Don't ask me what this means. I have no idea what Facebook is or how exactly it works. But <laughs> access to Facebook had been blocked prior to this time. But in a major concession on the 11th of March, Facebook suddenly became available. President al-Assad, also around this time, announced that he was going to give amnesty for 1,000 political prisoners, and that 1,000 political prisoners would be immediately released. Notice the regime is making some concessions. The regime is responding, at least in some positive way, to some of the demands that have been made at the very beginning of the protests. But this initial cycle of protest and reaction was eclipsed and is pretty much forgotten today when a much more severe outbreak of unrest erupted in the southern part of the country in the provinces around Dira, near the border of Jordan, in the third week of March. And much larger scale, much more uncontrolled popular protests erupted in this part of the country as March went along. The disorders around Dira famously began after a group of school children wrote on one of the buildings in the town a little bit of anti-Bathi graffiti. By all accounts, the graffiti that was written on the building said, said something like, the people want the regime to fall. The people want the falling of the Bashar al-Assad regime, which is similar to the kinds of slogans that had been made in Cairo, similar to the kinds of slogans that had been raised in Tunisia. But the police cracked down on these poor school kids. The police brought them into the police station, interrogated them, by all accounts threatened them with imprisonment. And when the police responded with such force 
to these poor school kids in the southern part of the country, the towns and villages around Dira erupted in anger. And large-scale protests continued, persisted in the southern part of the country day after day. And as the protests continued down in the southern part of the country, riot police gradually started firing into the crowds. And the protests stopped becoming so peaceful. The protests started to be an occasion for the use of violence, the use of force against the protesters. The state-sponsored media at first blamed the unrest down in the South on what the Syrian newspapers called Palestinian radicals. So the very first charge was that all of this order came from some of the Palestinians who were living in a refugee camp down in the south part of the country. But after a couple of days of blaming Palestinians for the unrest, the regime then started to charge that what it called, quote, an armed gang had started the protest. And an armed gang was carrying out the disorders in the south. The implication was that this armed gang had links across the border into Jordan. Perhaps the armed gang was somehow connected with smuggling, somehow connected with illicit trade going across the border, people operating outside the laws of the country. The regime also occasionally charged that the new head of the Muslim Brothers in Syria was taking the Muslim Brothers on a more violent course than the organization had followed for the previous 10 or 15 years. The regime charged that the new head of the Muslim Brothers had announced that the Muslim Brothers might resume militant activity against the regime. And the Muslim Brothers had not carried out militant activity against the regime since 1982. In fact, the Muslim Brothers have turned very much in the direction of liberal constitutionalism, very much in the direction of liberal reform rather than armed struggle against the regime. But sure enough, there's a new head of the Muslim Brothers in Syria. The new head of the Muslim Brothers had been associated with some of the armed struggle of the 1970s. So the regime charged that the Muslim Brothers were just about to embark on attacks against the regime as well. The disorders in Dira then gradually escalated, gradually became more and more violent. The regime found itself unable to suppress those disorders the way it had suppressed the popular protests in Damascus. Disorders quickly spread then to Latakia along the coast. And Latakia exploded into protest when opposition activists clashed with pro-government marchers. And counter-marches took place inside the city. Government supporters attacked opposition marchers. There were fist fights and clubbings back and forth between these two groups of popular protesters. There were reports in Latakia that the police were being shot at and that the police were being shot at by what the government called Sunni elements. Sunni elements, mainstream Muslim political activists, mainstream Muslim political activists who might well have connections across the border in northern Lebanon. And when it, looked, when it looks clear, and it does look clear to me, that police were being shot at, as well as the police shooting into the crowds, the government moved some of its large military forces into Latakia. And the government cracks down on Latakia by moving army units into the city and by moving units of the Republican Guard into Latakia. As the fighting was flaring up in Latakia, the population of the city of Hama in the north central part of the country took to the streets as well and the rebellion spreads next into Hama. By the end of March, violence had also erupted in the rural areas around Damascus. So even though the capital city itself does not exhibit very many popular demonstrations, popular unrest in the countryside outside the city has flared as well. <clears throat> 
By this time, the government was organizing pro-regime demonstrations to respond to the opposition. And by the end of March then, the government was organizing very large-scale marches to support the government, very large-scale marches to uh, pledge their continuing loyalty to the regime and their continuing loyalty to President Bashar al-Assad in particular. On the 30th of March, President Bashar al-Assad finally went on television to address the country. And there were lots of people who were wondering why the president had not said anything prior to this time. The unrest had been going on for almost a month. Finally, on the 30th of March, President al-Assad went on television. And in his speech to the country, the president admitted that the country's reform process had basically stalled out. The political reforms had not been made. Popular expectations for change in the country had not been met. And that the country had not carried out the kind of promise that people had, the expectations that people had when President Bashar al-Assad took over as president. But the president blamed for stalling out the reforms a number of external events rather than anything inside the country. The president blamed the Palestinian uprising of the year 2000 for preventing reforms from taking place. He blamed the United States invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq for blocking the reform process. And then he especially blamed the 2006 Israel-Lebanon war for putting a roadblock in the process of reform. So he basically charged that regional international events had prevented the country from going in the direction of opening up the political system. The president went even farther and charged that all of the present unrest was a result of what he called conspiracies. And that there were conspiracies against the nation, conspiracies against Syria from the outside. It wasn't Syrians themselves who were responsible for the unrest, but rather small groups of people who did not have the national interest at heart. On the other hand, during the, immediately after this speech, the government announced that it was going to create a special committee to study lifting the emergency law in the country. The country has been under a state of emergency since 1963. All kinds of political liberties, all kinds of constitutional guarantees have been uh, proscribed since 1963, and the government announced that now it was time to consider lifting the state of emergency law. The government also announced at that time that it was going to set up a special commission to review a census that had been carried out in 1962. Now, we might wonder what in the world is the political importance of a census that had been taken in 1962. But the 1962 census had consistently discriminated against the country's Kurdish population. As many as 200,000 Kurds that had lived in the country all their lives, that had been born and raised in Syria, were not counted as citizens in the 1962 census. And, six, and since 1962, hundreds of thousands of Kurds living in the northeast part of the country had been denied the rights of citizens, the president announced that now it's time to reconsider citizenship for the Kurds. As soon as this announcement was made, there were large-scale marches in Kurdish parts of the country, especially in Husaki and Al-Kamishli, large-scale marches in which the protesters chanted, we want freedom as well as citizenship. So some Kurds announced that citizenship wasn't enough. Just reversing the 1962 uh, census wasn't enough. From now on, it would be freedom and the constitutional rights guaranteed to sy Syrian citizens that had to be uh, uh, given to the country. The second week of April saw attacks on army stations and police stations in the coastal town of Banyas. So disorders spread to Banyas in the second week of April. 
And once again, the authorities link these attacks on the army and attacks on police to a Sunni network located in northern Lebanon and charge that Sunni Islamist activists are crossing the border into Syria and are based outside the country. The authorities respond to the unrest in Banyas by locking down the city, sending the armed forces around the city, cutting off all contact between the city and the outside world. On April 18th then, thousands of residents of the city of Homs in the middle part of the country march into the street and occupy one of the main squares of the city. They occupy the main square, the clock tower square, right in the middle part of the city. And the citizens of Homs march out and occupy clock tower square following the death of one of the leaders of a tribal confederation in Homs province, the leader of the Fawara, Fawara clan, excuse me, who had died under mysterious circumstances and at least it's this killing that precipitates or sparks the popular protest inside Homs. Oddly enough, as the disorder spreads in Homs, as the conflict escalates around Homs, the Ministry of the Interior announces that the emergency law has been rescinded and that the country no longer exists under a state of emergency. That whatever constitutional provisions had been present before the state of emergency had now been reinstated. The Interior Ministry also announces at this point that it's abolishing the state security court. The state security court that had sentenced many political activists to prison that had, um, that had broken up organizations on the grounds that they were political organizations. A week after this, the armed forces finally move into Dira in force. And the Syrian armed forces carries out a massive military operation in the southern part of the country. As soon as the armed forces move into Dira in force, the armed forces then move in to Banyas in force. And tanks and artillery forces are used against the general population of Banyas. The reports are that as soon as the tanks are finished in Banyas, they will move in the direction of Homs. And there are reports that tanks are already on the road, headed in the direction of this important central Syrian city. <laughs> 